So let's begin. <laughs> hey guys, I'm back and ready to dive into another Shakespeare monologue. Today it is Isabella from Measure for Measure. This one was requested by Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel, because this is a cracker. To whom should I complain? I love it so much. Now, don't be too embarrassed if you're not familiar with Measure for Measure because nobody is. It's rarely ever done, and when it's done, it's not always done well. So do not panic if you're like, what is Measure for Measure? I do recommend having a little look online for some online versions. Uh, there's a, a good one from the Royal Shakespeare Company, directed by Gregory Doran, I think just from a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think quite a bit of it's on YouTube, but it's also fully on digital theater. So if you have time to watch the whole thing, I do recommend it, because it really will give you an insight um, and is quite deftly handled and very interesting and quite funny, actually. And I do have to just give a warning, there is a little bit of a mention of sexual assault in this video because it does hinge on some of what the play and the monologue is about. So if that makes you feel uncomfortable in any way, this is not the monologue for you. I don't want to spend too much time on context for this monologue, but I will give you a little bit. If you're familiar with the play, please skip ahead where I'll break down the meanings for you and talk about the acting choices. So Isabella has just been talking to Angelo, who's kind of standing in for the Duke. So he's kind of like a proxy head of state at the moment in Vienna, which feels very kind of purist. People are being arrested and put to death because they're having sex before marriage and all this stuff is happening because Angelo is a little bit of a Puritan and he's like, no more of this, which the Duke said, great, you know, I want you to go ahead with all that. But I think even the Duke, who is secretly hanging around disguised as a friar, is kind of like, what is he doing? One of the people that's been thrown in jail for having sex before marriage with his lovely lady friend, Juliet, who is now pregnant, is Isabella's brother, Claudio. Now, Claudio goes to Isabella, please go and talk to Angelo, he's gonna love you, you're so virtuous, and so is he, you know, you guys will get along great. So she does, and they do get along great, sort of. Angelo really, really likes her, and he's a little bit thrown by this. He has a number of monologues uh, in the couple of scenes before where he's going, oh my goodness, what's happening to me? Because he totally falls for her, because of how virtuous she is. So Angelo finds himself in a bit of a weird position because he desires Isabella, but he's the one that's been cracking down on everyone for fornicating, as it is called in the play. So Angelo says to Isabella, go away and let me think about it and come back tomorrow. So she comes back tomorrow and he basically says, um, what if there was someone that could, you know, save your brother's life, but you had to do something for him? And she's like, what are you talking about? And he basically eventually lays it out that he wants her to sleep with him and if she does he'll spare her brother's life. Now this is a horrifying proposition to Isabella because she's extremely extremely religious and just would never even consider it. So she says to him I'm gonna tell everybody what you've done what you've said and he says who will believe thee Isabel? <sighs> Does it feel real to you or what? Like, does this happen today? Yes, oh my goodness. He says, uh, my unsoiled name, you know, I've everybody knows me to be virtuous and they're all just gonna think that you're, you know, trying to besmirch me because you want your brother to be freed. And she's stuck. And that's basically where he leaves her. He leaves the room and this is where her monologue begins. So in jumping into this monologue, there are two things you really need to think about before you even begin. Firstly, what exactly happened in that room? There's nothing really in the stage directions that explicitly states what happens, but it, it could be taken that perhaps Angelo tries to grab her or kisses her or whatever, like manhandles her in some way that she feels is not appropriate. So certainly read through the scene before and really track in your own mind what do you think happened exactly and out of that what will be the most powerful kind of stimulus for you as an actor to react to imagining that something has happened before you start the monologue. The second thing of course is who are you speaking to? This is a soliloquy so she is alone on stage so you need to make the decision about whether she is reflecting to herself, whether she's speaking to the audience, uh, whether she's praying even. I certainly think this is an active monologue and probably benefits from some sort of communication with the audience. And if you're speaking to the audience, treating them like a confidant, a close friend who she can confide in safely. 
So she begins, to whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? <sighs> it makes me feel horrible already. Firstly, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory in terms of it being quite close to modern English. She's asking probably the audience, who should I talk to about this? And that is really referring to the fact that Angelo is the head of state. There is no one above him. He doesn't have to be accountable to anyone. Sounds familiar. But just a reminder there that they actually two separate thoughts that you need to track. So the first one is, who would I tell about this? And the second one is, if I told anyone, who would believe me? Then her first kind of imagery here. Now the imagery of mouths is an interesting one in Shakespeare because often it's quite sexualized. And I think that's relevant here. A useful take on Isabella is that sexuality is possibly a little bit disgusting to her or terrifying. It's interesting to play with some of those really strong emotions that she could potentially be very, very afraid of sexuality. So when she's talking about something sexualized like perilous mouths, how does that make her feel? She's not just going, oh no, perilous mouths. It's actually like, this is a scary thing for me. And to explain what she's saying here, oh perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self same tongue, either of condemnation or reproof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. So here she's talking about Angelo being the person that can speak. So um, the, the mouth in this case, the person that could speak condemnation or approve. So either pardoning Claudio or condemning Claudio to death, that's an, in Angelo's power bidding the law make curtsy to their will. So he's the person in power making the law just work for him the way that he wants it to work. And then hooking both right and wrong to the appetite. And appetite always kind of means like whatever you like, whatever your preferences are. So hooking right and wrong to whatever you prefer to follow as it draws means like to pull it along. So she's got some imagery there of someone with a lot of power and she's used a kind of sexualized image in the mouth of speaking their will, making the law curtsy to them. It's like, you can you imagine someone being like pushing someone down and making them bow to them. It's very aggressive, very forceful and hooking both right and wrong to the appetite. So again, it's very forceful imagery. So she's saying that he's kind of grabbing whatever he likes and making it, shaping it the way that he wants. And so in that, there's a lot of kind of subtext about the unfairness here. For someone that is in power to really misuse their power in this way. Interesting too that she says, oh perilous mouths, not mouth. She's referring to Angelo technically, but it also gives you a picture of that that's how she now perhaps sees the world that actually all people in power have got this ability. Maybe that's something she never thought of before, which could be a really powerful thing to play. This kind of moment of realization where she's like, what is happening in the world? How do people in power have this ability to just make things happen however they like. Then out to my brother. Now notice that that's that half end of a line, which means she goes straight on. I would challenge you to go to follow, to follow as it draws out to my brother. She's going straight ahead with like, this world is ridiculous. I'm going to go to my brother. Now she starts to talk about her brother. Though he had fallen by prompture of the blood, yet had he in him such a mind of honour that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd, ye he'd yield them up before his sister should her bloody stoop to such a bored pollution. When she talks about her brother, she's acknowledging that he's done something wrong. That's the prompture of the blood, which is really just about the lust. He's fallen by prompture of the blood just means that he kind of it's fallen from grace so he's ended up in jail you know about to be put to death because of something in his blood being like the lust that drove him to be with his partner Juliet who actually he loves and then she sort of qualifies but actually he's very honorable so to just break down what that meaning is there yet have he in him such a mind of honor that had he 20 heads to tender down on 20 bloody blocks he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such a bored pollution she's talking about 20 people needing to be beheaded, so that's 20 bloody blocks. Um, he would just plonk them down and have them be executed to save her from that horrible sin that has been asked of her. I think the reference to such a bored pollution, what she's talking about there is sleeping with Angelo, that would be polluting her body. 
it's such strong language when referring to that sexual act. She just cannot deal with it at all. It just completely disgusts her, freaks her out. I think you really need to inhabit that in the body. So really thinking about like, what does it feel like in her body when she thinks about that idea of sleeping with Angelo? It's almost gonna make her skin crawl or make her want to vomit or scream or, you know, punch things or whatever she's she's going to have a very physical reaction to that idea and that she's connecting to that idea then when she talks about such a board pollution and they're really spitty words such a board pollution so i would really recommend that you make the most of those consonants there but final little bit then isabel live chaste and brother die more than our brother is our chastity I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. So she's basically at this end point going on to say, uh, I'm definitely not doing this. My brother will have to die. There's just no question in her mind at all. I think it's really interesting that she uses the word our, our chastity, our brother. Almost like, it's kind of like the queen's plural there. Like, we are not amused. I think there would be a reference to her being a part of a sisterhood as well and that our is referring to the fact that she's a part of a holy collective but also it really shows how she kind of separates herself and elevates herself a little bit she says i'll tell him yet of angelo's request and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest she's just saying that she's going to explain what angelo said but she's just going to set him up for the fact that he has to die because of course she's not going to give up her body for his soul's rest just means so he has enough time to pray and prepare himself for death. So in terms of the energy and the variety of the peas, I would start kind of small, build up quite high for O Perilous Mouths in that section. It's quite, she'd be quite angry and uh, frustrated about the abuse of power. Then when she talks about her brother, there's a lot more love there. Um, it can come back down a little bit more and a bit more about connection, about honor again, referring to that honor is very important. And then the final bit is a bit more matter of fact, I'm going to do this. If you have enough time, I recommend looking at Angelo's monologues as well. It really gives a lot of insight into the themes of the play, what people are struggling with, that hypocrisy and the desire, the humanity in finding that you are not as perfect as you thought you were. So I would recommend having a try of them and seeing as well, even if you're doing Isabella, how it informs, how they inform each other. And that's it for me today. Of course, as always, let me know if there are any monologues you would like me to do. Like and comment to help me get out to more people if you can. And subscribe if you love Shakespeare. Yay! See you next time.